We are in the uh, 30th chapter of the book of Proverbs, and we are beginning this morning with verse 4. Last week we began with verses 1 through 3, and I'll give you a quick overview of that. But beginning in verse 4, uh, who has ever ascended to heaven and come down? Who has, e who has ever gathered up the wind in his fist? Who has wrapped up the waters in his robe? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his son's name? Surely you know. Every word of God is purified. He is a shield for those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his word, otherwise he will convict you and you will be a liar. An interesting passage from this wise man, Agur, that we are studying together this morning. So last week, if you missed with us, we looked at the first line of verse 1. And we label that a superscription. And all superscriptions in the Bible we take to be inspired and profitable. So we do here. And then he moved on to tell us in verses 2 and 3 that he was unable to know God, much less understand God. Theologically, we call that the noetic effects of sin. The mind of man is broken. That is noetic, N-O-E-T-I-C. And that is defined as intellectual apprehension. The mind just simply does not work when it comes to spiritual things for the natural man. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, the Apostle Paul said, that the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God. They are spiritually discerned. And there are radio waves running through this room. You can't touch them, smell them, taste them, see them. And yet, if you have the right equipment, you can dial it in. And you can find out that there are radio waves going through this room. The natural man doesn't have the equipment. He must have the Spirit of God, said the Apostle Paul, in order for him to perceive. So, how do we understand minds like Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell, who we talked about last time? Their, their minds are brilliant, but when it comes to the things of God, they don't work. Uh, Cornelius Van Til from Westminster uh, illustrated this best, I think, at least to myself, that these men have a mind uh, like a power saw. So uh, they're out constructing a house, and we are their neighbor, and we're watching them build their house, and their power saw woo, woo, just moves through, cuts the boards. And here you are building your house, and you are sawing, sawing, sawing. And why they have got their house built and they've got it all hammered together, the foundation, and they're finished and they're on to other things and you're just barely getting started. Get your nails out, you know. Well, Van Til said the problem is with them is that their power saw, it's powerful, cuts but it's at the wrong angle. It cuts at a 45 degree angle because of the noetic effects of sin. And uh, as a result, they build their house, they construct it, they put it together, and then the winds come and the waves come and the storm is against it, their house falls apart. While yours, you were slow, but you cut your board straight and your house is all together. That's the problem with the natural man. He has no comprehensive knowledge of tracing anything back to God. Here's the example. In the garden, the science of zoology didn't begin uh, with 
man coming out of primordial mass or uh, the product of evolution. The science of zoology occurs in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 20 in the garden when he named the animals. So everything was traceable back to God, and he could see that and understand that. The problem with the mind of man, as we said last time, is he does not know, but even worse than that, he does not know that he does not know. And uh, so, uh, as a reminder, remember our starting point, or the way we approach the Bible, is if God does not speak to us, we simply do not know. Exodus 34, 5 and following, and the Lord descended in a cloud. Now, get that picture in your mind. He had to come down from heaven in a cloud, and there he proclaimed his name. He passed in front of Moses, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in goodness and truth. He had to tell us that or we would not know. So we must have revelation. Election is not the problem for most people. In reality, it's you give your mind too much credit. You cannot understand except you have spiritual illumination from God. Now, the last lesson we pointed out the difficulty of line 3 in verse 1 translated differently than your New American Standard or your King James. This is, uh, this is what the scholars are talking about in the last 10, 15 years uh, regarding their translations of Proverbs. And they have honed it in on a translation that came out of the Protestant Reformation. I like the translation because it fits the argument, and it's my job to show you that. The translation is, I am weak, O God, but I can prevail. Now, your translation in the King James and New American Standard gives you no information, really. Just a repetition of names. I like this translation, and I'm going to explain it by the Lord's help. But... He has told us that he is weak and his mind is bankrupt, but he can obtain, he can prevail. Now, don't miss that. That's what he's saying. So, verse 4, here we begin our exposition this morning. Agur applies Ithiel, who represents all of us. He's the student of the wise man with two rhetorical questions. Here they are. Who? 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 That's the first. And what? And what is the second? Now, back in the garden before the fall, the man and the woman had the knowledge of God. First of all, the creation was teaching them. Teaching them comprehensively. They were able to understand a flower, a tree, a bush, an animal, and trace it immediately back to God. Comprehensive knowledge of the creation. Quite different than Carl Sagan, the brilliant astrologist. Remember him? All that ever is, all that ever was, all that ever will be is the cosmos. He saw the cosmos, the creation, as something independent, standing alone. And what do the Scriptures teach us? Well, they're the handiwork of God. They are put on display by Him. His voice spoke them into existence. Everything is traceable back to Him. The man and the woman in the garden, they walked with God in the cool of the evening. The revelation of God was ready and available like turning on a faucet. It just flowed to them. And then the fall. 
and spiritual darkness set in. Fellowship with, was broken. They hid from him when he came walking in the cool of the evening. And here's what I don't want you to miss. The creation that worked for them and taught them now turned on them. Thorns. Thistles. In the Old Testament, we have a phrase that's often used. It's cut off. Cut off. What you had before has now been cut off. It's been severed. And you no longer have it anymore. That's what you see with Cain. Genesis chapter 4, don't we? The soil that had worked for him so readily, so available to him would not work anymore. God put a curse on it. That teaches us that Practically speaking, all your gifts, all your talents, all your abilities, they are from the Lord God alone. That's what David teaches us. Psalm 144, verse 1. Blessed be the Lord my God who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. My friends, you'll either take your gifts and your abilities and worship God for them and serve others with them or they will corrupt you and destroy you. That's what the Scriptures teach. Verse 4, look at these elements of creation. Heavens, winds, waters, horizon of the earth. See, they no longer teach us anything. Don't get anything out of them. And I know you don't either. We have to go to the Scriptures. And that's what John Calvin did so adequately for us. The four seasons of the year. I mean, we call them fall, winter, spring, summer. Calvin said they're providence. They're natural providence. And because they are the providence of God, they're very predictable. Natural providence. Providence. We can anticipate them. We can expect them. Everything is comprehensive, traceable back to God. And what Agur is telling us is that man has no ability to do that or understand it. So, man is left in darkness to explain his reality. And here's how he does that. Oh, that's lucky. Why? That's, a, that's really uh, an amazing circumstance, isn't it? A happenstance. It's all by chance, random. We hear people say, I believe everything has a purpose. Wow, isn't that heavy? Uh, a purpose for what? A purpose for what? How different was Joseph when he told his brothers, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. For the saving of lives. Well, let's think about that for a minute. Saving of lives. Yeah, the covenant family. The covenant family. The family that's given the promises. Him being in Egypt, that saved the family. And not only that, He saved all Egypt. And not only that, He saved all of those Bedouins that were out there that were idol worshipers, but they needed to be fed, and God in His kindness and goodness used the man Joseph to do that. That's why I always like to season my conversations with the word providence. It's a reminder to me that I live in the providence of God. I don't live by random chance. What Mark and Cindy are going through right now is the providence of God. I wish it was different. But God is in control. And it is His all-wise plan. And we pray for them to that end. 
So, to ascend into heaven and to come down, well, that's the feats of the Lord Jesus, God himself, not mortal man. Look at this fists of wind. That's vivid, isn't it? You people of Dallas, I mean, you amaze me. You're courageous. You have a tornado run across North Dallas. Why, you don't turn your TV sets off. You're watching the Dallas Cowboys. It comes down. Uh, it comes down Royal Lane. It wipes out Royal Lane. Uh, the center there, it jumps across uh, Dallas North Tollway. Wow, you're amazing. Back where I'm from. Ah, uh, Weather's not a phenomenon. Weather's a sport. Um, you go from a warning to a watch to an alert. Hey, they go wall-to-wall -wall coverage in everything. We send out our, our storm chasers. They've, we see them so often, they've now become celebrities. You drive down the freeway, there goes a storm chaser. He's got all these patches and badges and paintings all over his truck like a Formula One race car. They're invited to fishing and tackle shows. They sign autographs. Everybody wants your picture taken with a storm chaser. Yeah. And we get educated like never before. I know all about Moar and Gettner and Doppler 3D and Viper in color. Why, we can take uh, radar down to a half city block. That's what we get. All for what? For what appears to be random. But it's not random. No. Psalm 135, verse 7. He enables clouds to rise to the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with rain and brings out the wind from storehouses. It's all traceable back to Him, see? On March 25th, 2023, a Christian, Matt Lobham, he was manning the weather desk at WTVATV in Tupelo, Mississippi. He was growing more and more concerned as the morning went on when suddenly out of the sky came a very violent and deadly tornado bearing down on Armory, Mississippi. With just a minute before it was to hit, as he was watching it, he suddenly lost all his professional decorum. And he leaned over and put his elbow on the table and bowed his head and said, Lord Jesus, save these people. And not a lot was lost. Armory was hit, but all lived. Who? 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 It's the one who controls the winds and the waters, the horizons of the earth. What's his name? Well, I hope I've been with you long enough you know that name. It's from the verb to be. It's undefinable. You cannot explain it. It's beyond human capacity. It is the voice of the burning bush. The name that transcends time and explains reality. It moves men and women to do feats that are remarkable and unexplainable. He established, we know that word, look at it. Set, place, fixed. Psalm 11 verse 2, the arrow next to the, the string and the bow. It locks in. That's the word. What is his name? That's the second question. Well, it's beyond finding out. It's way beyond finding out. Um, theologically, in a theological class, 
we say He is self-existent, self-sufficient, sovereign, free. And then we go on to define those terms. Heavy stuff. Those are all incommunicable attributes. But look, He comes to us in flesh and blood. Emmanuel. God with us. Puts little children in his lap. He talks about two sparrows for a penny. Trivial things. Things that we pass by and would ignore instantly. And he was the, such a man, the kind of man that did the absolute no, no, never, no way. He touched a leper and he made him clean. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 that in fact this knowledge of God and it traceable back to Him is all over the creation. It's shouting us up at us every day. If we had ears to hear, you walk in the park, you'd have to leave. It's deafening. But you can't hear it. Those are the noetic effects of sin. We have to go to the Scriptures to learn. Abraham Kuyper said, think of the knowledge of God being the legs of a man. They help him to move from point to point to point to point. But when sin came in, man's legs no longer work for him. But now we have the Scriptures and they are the crutches to move us from point A to point B to point C and so forth. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 tells us that God is everywhere and He's shouting out to us in every place, but He also goes on to tell us that the natural man, He wants none of it. None of it. I don't, I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. It's antithetical to my thinking. That's man. And so we, Paul says He suppresses it. The power of his heart, he just presses down like a big spring. Doesn't want any of it. That's man. He goes on. He says, what is his son's name? The son in the Proverbs is the student. Remember? He learns from his parent. All through the Proverbs. Teaching the son... Wisdom, skill for living. So who is the Son? Well, Exodus 4.22, the Lord God said to Moses, Now, you go to the Pharaoh and you say to him, Israel is my firstborn, my son. So, you want to know wisdom? You want to have understanding? You've got to understand Israel. You've got to learn about them. You need to know the personalities. You need to understand the promises. And what were all the lessons that are readily available to us that we need to digest? Well, the Apostle does that for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. Teaching us poor Gentiles, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant regarding our fathers. Well, who were the fathers? That was Israel in the wilderness. Now, here's why I like the translation of line 3, verse 1. Agur is weak, but he says he can prevail. Now, question. Where did the name Israel come from? Remember Genesis 32:28 in the middle of the night 
Jacob is under attack. A man is wrestling with him, fighting hand-to-hand combat with him. And near daybreak, the man who came out of nowhere and was wrestling with Jacob asked him a question. What is your name? And he said, my name, my name is Jacob. And he said, your name will no longer be Jacob. It will be Israel. For, now he's going to explain. For you have wrestled with God and man and have, here's your word, prevail. You've won out. You've conquered. You've accomplished. (laughs) Think about that. Jacob defeated. He's weak. He's, He's just hanging on. Hanging on. And yet he prevails. He accomplishes. What about our friend Agur? No knowledge, no understanding, weak. That's his word, not ours. That's the word he uses here. And what happens to him? He accomplishes. He prevails. And now he's going to tell us how he does that. It's by listening to the voice and following it. Verses 5 and 6 are combined. Here we open with every. It is the authority for your life. It is true north. Follow it, says the Proverbs, and you will live an abundant life. It appears that Agur has been reading David's victory psalm. That's uh, Psalm 18, and that's 2 Samuel 22. Uh, Some of the imagery is one and the same. He prevails. David in the Psalms prevails by the Word of God. That's what he keeps saying to us. He conquers by the Scriptures, he says. When a person is biblically illiterate, they have... No purpose, no meaning. They have no comprehensive understanding of life. They are random. They are flip-flopping. They are inconsistent in everything that they do. The man who Henry Ironside said had the most marked and profound influence on his life He was uh, not a scholar. He was a Scotsman. He had no formal biblical education at all. He only had an English Bible. He had no masterful degrees, anything like that. But Ironside said that man knew the Word of God backwards and forwards. He learned it in a small house by candlelight on a dirt floor in Scotland. Purified, used of the cooking of precious metals, separating the middle from the metal from the dross. The idea here is that God's word is truthful. His truthful word is creative. He speaks as the primary cause. And he is witness to the effects of it. It seems like really nothing is happening when God gives us his word oftentimes, doesn't it? I mean, you you think you can go from point A to point B and you go rather quickly. No, not really. About 25 years ago, I had a real trial come into my life. Uh, A consultant who we were very close to in our company, he got into our file cabinets. He took two contracts out. He shredded them because 
they were not lucrative enough for him. And he saw how profitable our arrangement was with a utility in Detroit. And so he got rid of the contracts. And then when we couldn't find them, he met with my two senior people in Omaha and said that there are no contracts and he wants a new agreement written up. He left me with a message and tell Mike Black he doesn't have a prayer. Well, you know, I took that as a rally call, like a, a, a shofar horn blowing into my ear. And so I immediately went to my knees. David said, evening, morning, and noon, three times a day, I call out to God who ransoms me in harm for the danger that surrounds me. And so that's what I did. Three times every day, and more than three times often, seven days a week, I appealed to the Lord, called out to the Lord. This is about you, not me, I said. This is, he's challenged you, not me, I said. I didn't pick out this line of work. I never thought I would be doing this. But now, this is to your honor and to your glory. And I kept plying him daily. And one night, I'm washing my dog. I've got suds up to my elbows, water all over my shirt. And I'm washing my dog when suddenly, like a bullet, Exodus chapter 6 and verse 1 goes flying right here. The Lord God said, now you are about to see what I can do to the Pharaoh. <laughs> now, I'm not a name it, claim it guy. Believe me. And to show you what a dullard I am, I'm like the Emmaus travelers. Hard-hearted, slow to believe the Word of God. I go, where did I get that? Where did that come from? I've been reading Exodus. But it was powerful, and I got the message, and in the next few weeks, I got the answer. He lost his job. He lost his position. He lost his bank. And he had to settle with me for pennies on the dollar. I saw. Now, that's not normally the way God works. Study the Scriptures. Abraham is promised a seed, and what happens? Uh, he goes and walks with God for decades before that's fulfilled. And uh, so Isaac is the son of the promise. And so Isaac, how, how does he progress along? Well, he prays for his wife for 20 years. 20 years! And, and during that time, uh, how about his half-brother Ishmael? How's he doing? How's Ishmael doing? Are you kidding me? Ishmael's growing, expanding, prospering. He's got the green thumb in every direction. That's, uh, that's right there in the Scriptures, my friend. It's Genesis chapter 25 and verse 12. Uh, and so you have uh, Isaac and he has two sons. Uh, Jacob and Esau. Esau, not the son of the promise. That was Jacob, but my covenant will be with Jacob. And uh, how did he do? Well, he really did well. I mean, he had all these sons and one daughter. Man, he expanded his family quite a bit. How about Esau? How did he do? Uh, Esau. Well, let me put it to you this way. You and your wife save all this money and you're going to build a bookstore. And you find the right location, the right shopping center, and you're going to put it on the corner. And for five years, you labor night and day. You pour yourself into that bookstore. And you've done so well that you expanded it another 10,000 feet. And we, 
we say, we're so proud of you. How's your brother doing? Uh, that's uh, Genesis 36. That's Esau, Edom. He takes up the whole chapter. Uh, he had a bookstore too. It's called Amazon. You know, warehouses all over the country. He's out of books now. That's just a small sliver of his business. He sells everything out of that. That's uh, Esau. He's got kings and princes and he's got people. And he's expanded and he's grown. But you see, life is short. But life, in a way, is very long. And, uh, and look where He's brought you right now, today. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, you have already come. Death in your family, you've lost children. Husbands have lost wives. Wives have lost husbands. You've battled cancer. You've overcome. Yes, you wouldn't have written this script for a million years, and yet this is where God has taken you. And where are you this morning? Where are you? Well, at uh, 12 minutes after 10 in Dallas, Texas, you're at Believer's Chapel, and you're under the Word of God, and you're listening to it, and it's speaking to you. And it's telling you, I've got this. It's not product of random and chance and luck. It's an all-wise, carefully planned life. And your better days are still ahead because I'm going to walk it with you. And you're going to see it. And I'm going to show you. Look at this. He takes refuge in Him. All now your desires, all that you want to accomplish. Hey, look, it's all in Him. And so that's what I want you to learn. That's where I want you to come away from today. He's got you in His hand. And He takes your pains and your hardships and He takes your dark valleys and He puts light to them. When you open your wor this Word of His and the next thing you know, you get out of the boat and you do the impossible. You're walking on water and people are looking at you and saying, how? In the world, do you do it? It's very easy. You're hearing His voice and you're following it. My sheep hear My voice and they follow Me. And I give unto them eternal life. The best is yet to come for all of us, the best is yet to come. May God give us the grace and the strength and the power from His Holy Spirit to just be faithful today. We'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. But just believe it today and know that beyond it all, He's got a great plan for you and me, even in our old age, wherever we are, at whatever our stage is. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for this, Your eternal Word, the wisdom of Agur. And we're just the student and we're listening to it and it makes sense to us. We're so weak. We readily acknowledge that. We have no power. We have no ability. We don't think these thoughts. We could not write this book. There is no 
political speech that makes as much sense to us about ourselves as this your word. Therefore, we know it's from you. So teach us to number our days that we may apply a heart of wisdom. And we give you thanks and praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen.